let us begin with this one quote and let me have you guess from which study this quote is derived. There was also a no significant difference in mortality during the effective phase. However, a significant difference after the effective phase with higher mortality for lockdown countries was identified. I will reiterate, there was also no significant difference in mortality during the effective phase. However, a significant difference after the effective phase with a higher mortality for lockdown countries was identified. No, it is not the John Hopkins study, even though the John Hopkins study itself was quite good. And the reason for this statement here, beyond the obvious, was they took in all parameters, for example, financial values of lives lost to loss of economic disaster, uh, and so on and so forth, that could have had a negative impact on the what you described the collateral damage of the lockdowns. And this is from the following study. It is the COVID-19 pandemic. How effective are preventive measures for or preventive control measures? And is a complete lockdown justified? A comparison of countries and states. And this article was revised, I should say, December 23rd, 2021, accepted December 24th, 2021. And of course, now it is February 6th, 2022. And we'll revisit this article uh, in a little bit. And also, let's look at the John Hopkins. What did John Hopkins conclude? You ready? This sounds so rebellious. And here it is. The use of lockdowns is a unique feature of the COVID-19 pandemic. Lockdowns have not been used to such a large extent during any of the pandemics of the past century. However, lockdowns during the initial phase of the COVID-19 pandemic have had devastating effects. They have contributed to reducing economic activity, raising unemployment, reducing schooling, causing political unrest, i.e. Canada, contributing to domestic violence and undermining liberal democracy. You say undermining liberal democracy. These costs to society must be compared to the benefits of lockdowns, which our meta-analysis, speaking on behalf of John Hopkins, shown a marginal at best. Such a standard benefit cost calculation leads to a strong conclusion Lockdowns should be rejected out of hand as a pandemic policy instrument. It's kind of interesting here too on the John Hopkins study. We'll go into the data analytics in a second as well. And I was able to come out of uh, hiding for a little bit during this move to cover the um, the information in reference to VAERS and intervigilance uh, vaccine reports as well. And I like this little footnote here. And this is a great example of the correlation information that was utilized to justify the lockdowns. Another case of coincidence is illustrated by Chinoy, I guess, who finds that areas that experienced rainfall early in the pandemic realized fewer deaths because the rainfall induced social distancing. And what they're implying here is correlation is not causation, you hear quite often. And this coincidence between rainfall and reduction in deaths was their um, was one of their justifications in regard to utilizing social distancing. Now, if we look at prior studies, and this is a shout out to our friends in Canada, let's look right here uh, as we go here. Now, this is something you may not have been aware of was ever uh, mentioned or surfaced in the news, but here comes some interesting data that did exist. The World Health Organization Writing Group, 2006, stated, Reports from the 1918 influenza pandemic indicate that social distancing measures did not stop or appear to dramatically reduce transmission. What are we reading again? World Health Organization, 2006. 
the reports from the 1918 influenza pandemic, the Spanish flu, obviously, they like to use quite a bit in their examples. So that was an incredible correlation. As we read further, in Edmonton, Canada, isolation and quarantine were instituted. Public meetings were banned. Schools, churches, colleges, theaters, and other public gathering places were closed. And business hours were restricted without obvious, without, oh, sorry about that, went through there, without obvious impact on the epidemic. So if this information was already observed or correlated, and of course, all of us heard the examples about the Spanish flu in 1918 and basically the combination between uh, COVID-19 or comparisons, even though the lives lost in the Spanish flu were much greater because there were much younger individuals that were affected. How did they draw their conclusions that lockdowns would work this time if they didn't work back then? And that, I think, led to basically the statement out of this John Hopkins report, which they all have the links for you as well, too, which if I bounce around, said as follows, or I should say concludes as follows, that basically undermining liberal democracy. And that is from the following report that many of you may have heard in the media. Doo -doo. And that is, what pop back up here, sorry about that, which is the literature review in the meta-analysis of the effects of the lockdowns and COVID-19 mortality. And part of the reason why I'm doing this video tonight during the middle of a move is because I heard them attempt to basically undermine this incredible meta-analysis by saying it was just the opinion of uh, some of the researchers at John Hopkins University. No, that's incorrect. And I'm not going to allow them to get away with that again. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis. And John Hopkins I have an incredible respect for, and this was quite brave. And of course, what they discovered as well is basically they reduced COVID mortality by 0.2% on average. And so shelters in place were also ineffective, uh, so on and so forth. But we'll look at the abstract and reference to that in a little bit. And good evening to all of our friends out there. So basically what we're looking at right now is when I state the house of cards, we've been doing this for over a year and a half. And the observational data never panned out to support uh, their hypothesis, but yet they just kept on going and going and going. So much so that honestly, I have to agree with a lot of other individuals that basically so many lives have been harmed. Um, I think honestly, you know, basically in reference to how they've hurt people uh, in, in spite of all of the actual data that possibly criminal charges should be pursued. That's just my idea. This has been a horrendous thing. We've torn each other apart, so on and so forth. And you all know, we've been doing this for a long period of time and never once did we see the data to support their arguments. And I'll give you an example to a reference to vaccines. Now let's look at this. All right, we're gonna come back to this in a second. And let's look at, I believe right here. And this is an interesting observation, too, in regard to percentage of the population vaccinated. What do you see here? Let's move up a little bit. Now, remember, this is the people fully vaccinated as of February 5th, 2022. So let's get that out of the way. So what we're looking at right here, these are the countries which have the most vaccination. There it goes away. See right here, 0 to 10 people vaccinated, 11 to 20, 21 to 30. 81 to 100. Now, this is a pretty interesting correlation between new cases smooth per million. And if you look at the other data, to be fair, reproduction rate, uh, let's see this couple again. Up oh, there it goes. New deaths per million, so on and so forth, and total cases per million as this flashes on and off between uh, the countries which are utilized. And you look at the countries which had, do not have heavy vaccination. Draw me a causal argument. I understand the evidence in a lab setting, but you know, where, how can you draw 
even a correlation, never mind causation. And so that's the data as it stands. And I'm waiting for that house of cards to fall next. But on the positive note, let us look at what we're going to cover tonight. Are you ready? Ba -ba -ba. All right. We're going to cover pre-infection deficiency of vitamin D associated with increased disease severity and mortality among hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Really good uh, recommendation and reinforcement of vitamin D uh, as well, too. Influence of nutritional intakes in Japan and the United States in reference to COVID-19 infection. Great observational data. I've been looking for a long time for epidemiologists to get involved in looking at the dietary differences that may be responsible for why the United States is, has a mortality rate 17.4 times higher than Japan. And the reason Japan's important in reference to this is because we can't utilize longevity or lifespan as an argument to why we have a greater susceptibility to COVID-19. So what else can it be? Then we look at bottom line, a cross-country analysis of the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines and reducing mortality rates within the EU. Let's get this one out of the way real fast, since it's really just uh, an excerpt. What we're reading here is as follows. Our results indicate that one percentage point monthly increase in the total number of vaccinated people was associated on average with a decrease of two deaths per general population per 1 million for the next month, with the effect being highly significant. Now, in the opinion of the author, a uh, reduction of two deaths per 1 million over 30 days is highly significant, and I will not uh, veer from uh, that or interject publisher bias because they're quite impressed by that reduction in mortality. But are you really that impressed with that reduction in mortality compared to the reports to Udur Vigilance or the VAERS database? To proceed forward, and we won't come back to that because it's only an excerpt I wanted to grab from the uh, following study. Then, BNT COVID-19 vaccinations associated with increased risk of carditis. And this was from the American College of Physicians. And let's get this one out of the way too, because it's just an excerpt as follows. Patients who received the you know, BNT162B2 were three times more likely to experience carditis than unvaccinated patients. Cumulative incidence of carditis of vaccination was 0.57 per 100,000 doses. And you have to go by doses now because people are getting more than one dose. But again, the conclusion from the American College of Physicians, at least with the outcome, was as follows. Three times more likely to experience carditis than unvaccinated patients. And you have to run your own risk-benefit analysis on that. To proceed forward, as follows, SARS-CoV-2 can, SARS-CoV-2, can remain active for longer than recommended quarantine periods, going back to lockdowns and so on and so forth. Real interesting one from Brazilian researchers. They followed 38 COVID patients and found that it took a month on average for the diagnostic test to become negative. In three patients, the virus remained detectable for more than 70 days. I don't know if there's any other highlights in there. That was about it, but that just give you an idea that we're learning so much and we are beginning to learn the futility of our assumptions. To proceed forward, and we won't come back to that, but I'll have all the links for you so you can follow it on your own. Another one excerpt we'll just grab. First U.S. peer review study on Omicron patient outcomes reveals rapid spread and significant differences in infection behavior. The reason I favored this article is because of the following statement that you may not, may not have heard. Are you ready? Here it goes. The new variant. As of mid-January, the researchers have also identified three patients with BA.2 stealth Omicron. So now we have stealth Omicron, which requires whole genome sequencing to distinguish it from Delta. So a lot of what may have appeared to be Delta could have been stealth Omicron. The original BA1 Omicron strain. So Omicron, ironically, is has been already mutating. These are the first three stealth Omicron cases discovered and in Texas. 
And so again, the link will be there as well. So now you have to look forward to Stealth Omicron, which could possibly make it look like Delta's making a comeback, but it's not Delta, it's actually the BA-2 variant. To proceed forward, uh, we'll look at this one more in detail. Waning of anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, 100 to 200 days after the second dose. Ah, might as well get it away now, here goes. Bottom line says as follows, in conclusion, uh, the duration of the anti-S anti -S antibody response, the BNT162B2 vaccine was short-lived, particularly in males. The anti-S antibody levels of da -da -da -da, were lower according to SARS-CoV-2, immunoglobulins, 2 quant, Abbott, da -da, might indicate insufficient protection against Delta, if it's not the stealth Omicron, and the majority of participants appear to have lost their protection 200 days after vaccination. And henceforth, they want to up that ante and have you get a booster because they know the original gamble of this is no longer may no longer be valid. Let's, let's parse our words carefully. To proceed forward, and that was from whoops, doo -doo -doo -doo, that article there, in which the links will be there for you to follow. COVID-19 pandemic, how effective preventive control measures is a complete lockdown justified? All right, now we're going back to that. We'll cover, go back to that again. Uh, this was the abstract to the COVID-19 COVID thing and from John Hopkins. So welcome to that too. And then our data sources are as follows. We're going to be using your Duravigilance. I always have a hard time pronouncing that. Your Duravigilance. And then we'll be using bears. And, oh, check this out. Ready for this? All right, here we go. N another, remember, I'm doing this between moving between states, so there's no formality to this. So I'm just messing around. So this is a January 28, 2022. And just for validity, there's our, our zip file size. Now, what does that mean in context? Are you ready for this? Da, 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 da. So well, before we go before we go any further, here we go. The, let's, get the, let's get the disclaimer out of the way. And let's go to VAERS data, or uh, right there. While very important monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is equally inaccurate or coincidental or verifiable. In large part, reports of errors are voluntary, which means they are subject to biases. All right, so let's get that out of the way. Here we go. So let's look at this data again. Are you ready? Uh, the VAERS data sets go here. We go, yeah, I have, da, 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 I just read that to you. All right, so what does that number mean? Let us look. Da, da, da. Okay, not that one. This one. Let's give it a second. All right, here. So here we are. This is the vaccine adverse event reports reported to Varus for 2022. Again, we went through this like two weeks ago, and hopefully I get to do this again next week, but I may be busy again, if, but I will come back. So what does this mean? Now keep in mind, what did we look at? We looked at January 28th. These reports were right there, as you see. So not even 30 days into the year. Let us look, what do we have? What does this mean? There we are. Let's go keep on going back. So here we are. Oops, let's look at that far. Let's go do, 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 right here. That's better. So this is the size of the zip files. For example, for 1991, 1998, 2009, 2017. And what is interesting about this is this right here is only the first 30 days where the zip file size was 2017. This is all the data that comes in from the adverse event reports and so on and so forth. Uh, the first 30 days of January was larger than the entire accumulative uh, information gathered from vaccine adverse event reports for 2016, 2017, all those years prior. And the reason that has such an incredible velocity is cause for concern. Because if nothing's working, 
then why expose individuals to potential risk if the benefit yielded from an observational scale, I'm saying an observation, it's interesting how selection bias works. And I'm just picking the observation uh, is in question. So yes, so what we have here is as follows. We're looking at 8.39 megabytes is the size of the zip file of all the adverse event reports uh, accumulated to the CDC. And it is already larger than the entire year of 2017 and 2016 and cumulative. What would you say there? Uh, if we add close to the first decade of vaccine adverse event reports, the first week of January is pretty much one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is approximately the same size as the first decade of VAERS reports. The first decade of VAERS reports, and I included 2000 up in next week, is about the same size of all the adverse event reports just for the first 28 days of January. So that brings our next house of cards into question. So let us begin with the data and the positive stuff first. Let's go boom, 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 not the data. I should say the science reports. And let's look at this. They've been knocking vitamin D from the beginning. A lot of the, I, don't, I have no clue why there's been such a resistance to vitamin D. But again, to read the study and to be uh, polite to the researchers itself, pre-infection deficiency of vitamin D is associated with increased disease severity Efficiency, I say, and mortality among hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Now, this is going to play into the Japanese study as well in regard to how important diet is, or I should say how much diet is correlated with COVID-19 severity. And we go down here, we read as follows. The study is among the first to analyze vitamin D levels prior to infection which facilitates a more accurate assessment than during hospitalization when levels may be lower, uh, may be lower secondary to the viral illness. The findings report built upon results initially published on the Metarex uh, IV. Ready? Check this out. As we go down here, we're going to bring it to the middle of the screen. Patients with vitamin D deficiency, less than 20 nanograms a milliliter, were 14 times more likely to have severe or critical cases of COVID-19 than those with 40 nanograms a milliliter. Strikingly, mortality among patients with sufficient vitamin D levels was 2.3%, in contrast to 25.6% in the vitamin D deficient group. Now, as this data unfolds, the question is, Truly, the question is, I have no clue what a large segment of the media has against the nutrients per se. This would be like one of the easiest, easiest non, uh, I should say totalitarian, draconian way to basically improve the health and the positive outcomes in reference to any sort of disease mitigation whatsoever. But yet, even though this has been floating around for quite some time, people have vested more research trying to discount it, then actually look into it into the detail it needs to be looked into. And look, think of all the lives that could be saved if they just got off their high horses and said, hey, there can be nutritional prophylactic assistance. I'm not going to say any words that are going to be censored that can yield us benefit in association with this particular coronavirus that makes sense i mean simply just about i mean seriously if it's if it's about saving lives then the path of least resistance should be the first one we take let us begin path of least resistance there's a lot to go with when you talk about uh vaccine hesitation are you ready here we go next this is really a good one too let's make this a little bigger because the blue there ah Whatever happened here. Well, just now I'll keep it the same size. All right, here we go. Move that out. Abstract. The US and Japan are democratic industrialized societies. Well, it depends on what you think of mandates. But the number of COVID-19 cases and deaths per million in the US, including Japanese Americans, 
mean, nothing to do with ethnicity. Are 12.1 times to 17.4 times higher, respectively, than those in Japan. The aim of this study was to investigate the effect of diet on preventing COVID-19 infection. Now, what they discovered was as follows. Uh, comparative food intakes, those in the U.S. were as follows. We, the U.S. consumed 396% more beef, 235% more sugar, uh, only 44.3% as much fish, 11.5% rice, half a percent soybeans, which surprised me, and 54.7% tea. The last four of these foods contain functional substances that prevent COVID-19. I'm reading purely from the study, so do not, please, censor me. The prevalence of obesity is 7.4 times and 10 times greater than the U.S., and henceforth, the hypothesis in regard to nutritional intake. So here we go down to the bottom real fast to see what their conclusion was. Really good study. They went through a lot, a lot of detail in reference to the diet. Again, this is something we tried to encourage for a long period of time. And for example, green tea and things like that, we were all read about it's, uh, its effect in reference to seaweeds itself. Uh, Fucoxanthin we read about, heparin, which basically is a seaweed compound. Uh, soybean intake, so on and so forth. Uh, it goes into the possible hypothesis of why these may have a solid impact. Again, I'll link for you also as well. Uh, intakes of rice and wheat, we're not talking refined flour, so keep that in mind. Uh, really good breakdown. And the conclusion was generally as follows. Let's just go there. The difference in number of COVID-19 cases and deaths per million between Japan and the U.S. Uh, is 12 to 17 times. Large differences in diet of the two countries. Perhaps through lowered immune resistance induced by extreme obesity. The U.S. diet, which is high in junk food and has a high uh, D2, especially in minority groups, may increase vulnerability to COVID-19 infection. The Japanese dietary pattern is close to a nutrient-dense dietary pattern and contains many substances to prevent uh, substances that prevent COVID-19 infection. Again, I am reading verbatim. Although there are various factors involved, so on and so forth, it gives a great, great hypothesis and observational data as to why is the U.S. so susceptible to anything in reference to this. To proceed as follows, next study. A cross-country analysis of COVID-19 vaccines reduced mortality rates. I went through that. And again, it's two tests per, per general population of 1 million for the next month. And again, if you consider that to be highly significant, and again, not certain how it's working with the current one as, as far as variant, um, then so be it. To proceed forward, we read through this. Yes, carditis is now being risk, and it says, quote, unquote here, markedly increased in adolescents after the second dose may warrant refined vaccine strategies. Markedly. You know, you keep on vaccinating children and I, science is not supposed to be a virtue thing. And if the data is not supporting it, then it, it's criminal to can pursue it. To proceed forward, just like the lockdowns. SARS, COVID-19, should remain active long. Well, we read that. So some people may never be able to leave their home, it seems like. All right, the first U.S. peer-reviewed study on outcomes, this one with the stealth Omicron. And then we look at the waning of anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike antibody levels. Uh, again, 200 days after vaccination. So if this is truly an argument to reference to the immune, to the non-immune, as opposed to the vaccinated and non-vaccinated, yeah, that's when natural immunity comes in and a whole other slew of other aspects that have to be taken into account. Let me see if there's anything else that was down here we may have missed or not covered towards the end. Yeah, that's pretty much the conclusion. Um, yeah, they basically they lost their effectiveness at least after this, uh, the very short lifespan. The vaccine may have been great as a firewall initially, but after that, it's been oversold. Let's put it that way. All right, then after that, COVID-19 pandemic, how effective is it could uh, control measures? This, again, to reiterate, to repeat, this is not the John Hopkins one. This study has come out of Germany and Australia. Ironically, Australia, another heavy-duty, maniacal lockdown country, 
um, as opposed to even like Canada and the places like that, the threat to a liberal democracy or whatever, republic or whatever you want to call us, uh, quite intriguing at that how the data is becoming ignored at this point in time. But let's proceed forward down. We read that basically severe lockdown countries have a higher mortality. That's what the data shows. Let's see if there's anything else towards the conclusion uh, that we can look at. I may have covered or highlighted. Again, these are not just ops, these are not just basic opinions. This is pretty heavy duty in reference to basically what they're researching. And if they're saying that lockdown countries have a higher mortality, now there could be other confounding factors involved, no doubt. But, but how much further do we want to go in enforcing this? First, I said provides the necessary support for the Anders Tengel's comment that a lockdown has no historical scientific basis for being efficient, even if our data are from the present. They have no historic. Where the heck did they even come up with the idea that lockdowns are all of a sudden work? Give us two weeks and we'll flatten the curve. I don't care, Republican, Democrat, Independent, whatever it is. If you're doing stripping people of their civil liberties and you have no scientific basis in which to do it, and it's, everyone just falls in line like that without question, yeah. After that, proceed forward. You actually tell them a little miffed. You have to understand, uh, one of the businesses I run, the first thing that happened is the health inspector came in and we asked them questions because they wanted us to stop people coming into the store that were that were uh, now wearing masks. And I said, that's, you know, I, I don't want to get in trouble for false imprisonment. There's no legal protection for that. And he goes, well, you have to. And I go, well, why? And he goes specifically, quote, unquote, because you have no constitutional rights. Yeah, that put a bad taste in my mouth right from the beginning of the pandemic. And he wrote it down. And so we've actually posted it on the window of our store that I apologize for this and that, but the health department came in and said, we have no constitutional rights to prevent, uh, to allow you, you know, any sort of uh, freedom of um, self-determination in reference to basically, you know, what you value, what you don't value. And when someone tells you you have no constitutional rights, and you think you live in a fairly free society, then you know if if freedom is something you have to ask permission for, then you're really not free. So as the statements, the case for shutdown are clear, and the shutdown wins is what they said, and therefore no longer valid, either as the losses from COVID-19 casualties per population depend on the mortality during the effective phase rather than on lockdown measures themselves. And the burden of economic downturn after lockdown still affects these countries. It must be emphasized, however, that these conclusions are valid across a range of countries in terms of the average or median data, whereas individual countries will respond differently to lockdown or no lockdown in terms of the effectiveness. So the statements, the case for shutdown is clear, basically, and the shutdown wins. No longer valid. But yet it continues. So if it continues past the data that's required to make a uh, basically an adequate decision in reference to risk assessment, then, you know, I, honestly, a lot of these leaders have to be removed from office, impeachment or otherwise. Otherwise, it's criminal. Uh, and then as follows, compliance, they found out as follows, compliance is mainly driven by the duty to obey authorities and personal morality rather than by perceived risk of legal sanctions and perceived risk of the virus. A lockdown is nothing but enforces compliance, specifically by rules, law, police, and fines, which in turn risk increasing non-compliance or the so-called lockdown fatigue. Uh, so Machiavellian of them. And so as we have all these little princes running around, you know, running to rule by fear as opposed to actually being loved, so to say. And to conclude, in this study, again, this is not the John Hopkins study. In this study, we provide three new epidemiological parameters related to the effectiveness of controlling a highly contagious disease, as well as a method for calculating these parameters, which will duly be ignored, probably. These data were determined for 92 different countries, states, and provinces, comparing the effectiveness of this data of countries with, with and without lockdowns, 
revealed that there was no statistically significant difference in the effectiveness between lockdown and relaxed measures. Remember how we're all jumping on Sweden's case uh, to be nostalgic? Furthermore, there was absolutely no statistically significant difference in the mortality during the effective phase between lockdown and relaxed measures. These results did not provide any evidence that on average lockdown measures are more efficient and that the number of casualties per population were less. Again, I'll have a link to this study as well because chances are the media missed this one. And this one is a really, really good study when they weigh out everything between the economic damage, uh, depression, isolation, so on and so forth. And their observation, higher mortality for lockdown countries. All right, to proceed forward. A literature review. This is the John Hopkins study. Let me move this myself down here. See if I can get this moving a little bit bigger. Yeah. So you can read there. There it goes. It goes, the literature review and meta-analysis of the effects of lockdowns on COVID-19 mortality. So this is a little different than the German and Australian study, but to proceed as follows. But it's I like that because this, this reiteration, uh, they kind of confirm each other, even though their studies were actually being conducted at a parallel time. You see what I mean? And so this, this study, which some in the media said was just opinion, looked at 34 studies that ultimately qualified. To quote, more specifically stringency index studies find that lockdowns in Europe and the United States only reduce COVID-19 mortality by 0.2% on average. Now, and shelter in place was also ineffective, only reducing COVID mortality by 2.9% on average. And so while this meta-analysis concludes that lockdowns have little to no public health effects, they have imposed enormous economic and social costs where they've been adopted. In consequence, the lockdown policies are ill-founded and should be rejected. Let's let that go away. Rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. You can't get more solid than that. Not maybe or should that you often hear in a lot of the, the um, conclusions of many um, observational studies reference to looking at meta-analysis, what they should or shouldn't. This just says should be rejected, period as a pandemic policy instrument. Now, how many countries are still using lockdown measures and will proceed, pursue and continue to use lockdown measures? Many, many countries which we deemed as being free countries. And in the end, not really. To proceed forward as follows, now we go into the John Hopkins study as far as we look at the actual study itself, which I'll have links as well. And this is right here. Make sure this mouse does begin to fall. Let's begin. There we are. And that's the study itself. And let's see down here, the authors. I want to see if I have anything to highlight from the abstract. Uh, we read through that. And they brought some interesting comments because you could see the frustration beginning to evolve in their argument as they begin to read all these meta-analysis, uh, how a lot of the studies that were utilized to justify what's called these NPIs uh, were bad studies. And the cool part about this, which I like a lot about the study and our review of the meta-analysis is they break down real easy as to why a lot of these studies were so poorly done. Um, you know, it break, you know, it's like, who's monitoring this? Uh, the comments, the study, the authors, these are the eligible studies. It goes into why, also the weaknesses of the studies, if there are any. And then the ones that it rejected, the ones that really were utilized as far as a form of selection bias, uh, were quite interesting. Now keep in mind, this, this looked at everything. And you'll see it more in a second. And especially masking everything. And so as we begin to go down, so let me scroll down. Let's do it this way, page down. Hang on a second. It goes into uh, metadata for the studies included in the meta-analysis. And yeah, I apologize for the, the frequent scrolling. Page down, page down, page down, page down. I want to get you some of the highlights. 
And you could see this was this is not an opinion piece. This is an actual really well done look into the studies that were uh, that basically affected all of us. Uh, the MPIs. Um, they looked at, for example, the modern certain evidence that wearing a mask probably makes little or no difference in the outcome of the laboratory confirmed influenza compared to not wearing a mask. Uh, it goes on to all the, the everything, everything that really basically was kind of oppressive unnecessarily. It goes into all of those studies and the John Hopkins study, which is very difficult to find sometimes, but again, I'll have a link for you is great. And here we go. Overall, meta analysis fails to confirm the lockdowns had a large significant effect on mortality rates. Uh, you know, examining the lockdown strictness and so on and so forth, the shelters in place. We've read through here the reports from 1918 influenza pandemic uh, indicate that social distancing measures did not stop or appear to dramatically reduce transmission. In Edmonton, Canada, a lot going on in Canada right now, isolation and quarantine were instituted, public meetings were banned. Schools, churches, colleges, theaters, and other public gatherings were places were closed, and business hours restricted without obvious impact on the epidemic. So as we scroll down a little bit more, let's see right here if we can get the, another one of the highlights. Again, I would love to read the whole thing, uh, but it's quite a bit. Here we go. The use of lockdown is a unique feature of the COVID-19. Read this. Lockdowns have not been used to such a large extent during this huge social experiment we're going through, pandemics of the past century. However, lockdowns during the initial phase of COVID-19 have had devastating effects. We went, we went through that, uh, domestic violence and especially undermining liberal democracy. And where is the one piece of information I would like to, and here is, I think the excluded studies right here, Appendix B 7.1. And it goes into all of the, a lot of these studies are actually duplicates duplicate studies that they utilize in order to rationalize uh, a lot of the lockdowns being, I mean, their justification for lockdowns. Now, I want to see one thing real fast if said in the abstract here. I'm just curious. Let's proceed forward. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, so policy, the, the, the internal development, da, da, da. not trying to shelter in place. Yeah, it goes into the whole thing and you'll find also too, uh, now a government mandate to restrict people's possibilities of policies that limit internal movement, close schools, businesses, ban international travel. It went into everything, everything in regard to it, including the mass thing. And they said that basically it had little to no effect. In fact, yeah, just, it just it was just not there. And so John Hopkins did a really brave thing in regard to um, looking at this whole lineup here. And uh, now you're seeing what's happened with a lot of our Olympic athletes as well, where there's still maniacal on it, but yet, you know, disease and the other type of versions of the coronavirus or vaccine, uh, vaccines, variants are concerned, still begin to rise in an inconsequential level. And now that it's endemic, you know, hypothetically, they can keep lockdowns going forever. All right, to proceed as follows into our data. Again, I make this kind of fast, uh, faster than normal. Let us look. Da, da, da. All right, and here we go. We looked at this. That is the basically the size of the databases. Is there any of the data here of interest? Now nah, we're just building on a new year, which may end up being bigger than the year prior, which would be kind of scary. And look at the zip file size. Let's get to our mutations. All right, this is basically, we're looking at how things are working on a international scale, if it pops up. We looked at that. Let's see if there's anything else of interest we need here. Da, da, da. Now check this out. Oh, this I want to show you. Watch this. Ready for this? This will give you an idea. This is the new case thing. Check this out. Right here we are. What do you notice? All right, this is wonderful. All right. Right here, looking at the elevation of people fully vaccinated per 100, and that's the y-axis, right? Well, it looks like an x, this is the x-axis. And this new case is moved per million. What do you see? You see that? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? All right, proceed forward. Let's keep on going. 
Da, da, da. Come on. Move, 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 move. Takes a second, then it jumps forward. And look at all the countries. These countries are heavily vaccinated. Cuba is like super vaccinated and so on and so forth. But they're going to change the uh, the dynamics of what fully vaccinated means, of course. Whether it be a booster, four boosters, or whatever it is. And a lot of countries just said, forget it. And I think that's if the data on that one. Yeah, if you look at new cases, smooth per million. Let's bring it that way. Yeah, you don't see anything there. Total boosters, I'm curious too. And uh, China's kicking out the boosters left and right. And so, yeah, it just gives you an idea. Without going down any further, all right, let's look at the vaccine adverse event reports to endure vigilance. The European Union uh, is now at, whoop, one second, is now at 1,478,135 adverse event reports reported uh, given to endure vigilance. Remember, that's not a virus. That's not our CDC. This is Europe. So you have 1,478,135 as of actually February 5th. I think, yeah, so we did that just recently. And then proceed forward. We go here. Our 2022, this is how we're breaking off on adverse event reports for the start of 2022, again, the first 22 days. We had 30,710 adverse event reports from since January 1st. And as we look, go to scroll down. It always takes a second. Uh, individuals that have died, uh, the reports of death submitted to VAERS from the C to the CDC since the beginning of this year has been 702. So now I want to start comparing this to basically outcomes in reference to um, Omicron. Now, if we look at each one of these, um, the mortality, now check this out. Look at this too. Now, this is the reports of myocarditis. And look what we have here as far as the beginning of January compared to all of that. Now, keep in mind, sometimes these reports take time to be logged in, but there they are. And so it's an interesting dynamic, but to proceed forward. And I think that's probably that one for that one. Let's finish that one out. And then we go to, let's look at the two years combined. Now this is COVID-19 for basically uh, the vac vaccine reports from 2000, no, from 2021 January to today. So if you look at this right here, from there to there. And these are the primary reports, but we're at 720,512 non-duplicated reports. Again, in order to report this accurately, you do have to remove the duplicates. Now, those have had a booster. These are the side effects uh, of vaccine adverse event reports that have been reported. And again, as always, I am shocked. Expired product is being administered so often as one of the top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So in the top 10 adverse event reports due to the booster expired product uh, is one of them. That would seem like it'd be such an easy thing to mitigate, but product storage errors, uh, extra dose administered, and so on and so forth, which are really odd reasons to have adverse event reports because those are really easy things to fix. All right, let's see here. And if you look right here, vaccine dose series. So I would normally think three would be the error would be starting out. These are the people who obviously had a booster and also had an adverse reaction. But I wonder about this six and even seven plus, if there are people just vaccinating the heck out of themselves. I think it's more of a, um, a misnomer or incorrectly uh, logged information. At least I hope it is. Does that make any sense? All right, proceed. Uh, Non-duplicated mortality reports to VAERS is now at 10,103. Again, it's important that you don't duplicate. And if you notice here, you can notice uh, this gives you an idea of, um, you see, for example, cardiac failure, brain death, um, you know, death, I guess that's one of them malaise, dizziness, um, you could see their stories. And 
there were actually a most majority of them end up being some sort of cardiac event. And it's just, you know, it's amazing because that's just, and again, I'm just, I'm not doing anything. I'm just going through the area there. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's unusual as far as the mortality. It's there. It's there are actually well-documented reports. And I'm just surprised the CDC has not done more in order to identify any sort of um, safety signals, so to say. You, know, you get an idea? All right, proceed forward. Go up. These are non-duplicated mortality reports by age, though complex. And I think that is it for the 2002. And then let's go to our states here. All right, and real fast. All right, this is the this is interesting. Check this out. Let the oops, go down. Now this is really the age mortality breakdown. Now what you're noticing right here is this age group, for whatever reason, is now catching up to the 85 year and older age group right there. And so is this. Uh, the youth still really, really low, which is good. But however though, this is intriguing. And so if we continue to move forward, let's give it a second here. Boom, boom. Let's, if we look at our states and our mortality overall, uh, get out of there. That's the hospital stuff. Da, 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 da. Gloom and doom, gloom and doom, doom scrolling. Now the weird part about, no, I'm in the way again. Weird, the weird part about it is, for example, if you look at the mortality per 100,000 uh, at 4.94 or higher compared to you know, right here at April 15th. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, doesn't look like much of anything is benefited anybody, including inoculation. So that argument is really pretty weak because if you figure that 65% of the population is inoculated, it shouldn't be higher than April 2020 unless the inoculations only lasted 200 days. Proceed forward, and here we are, new deaths per 100,000. And of course, remember Florida, the Neanderthal statement. How is Florida doing new deaths per 100,000? There's Florida. They've been in California, New York. Now, Texas is a little higher, but they have the self Omicron thing. Let's put it that way. But still just the same. You have to draw, are lockdowns effective or more effective than states that may have already had a higher seroprevalence levels or exposure, I should say? Good question. And then, you know, it's a drop. Remember those, ooh, right up. New cases per 100,000, then do. Omicron was here and Omicron is gone. And the, what is the average length of a variant? Was what, four months? And look at that. Look at, on all aspects. So if we go, let's say for example, four weeks. I mean, these are lockdown states and here is no lockdown, no lockdown. Do you, can you draw a causal argument? No, but you know, then, you know, it's like, what the heck? But that gives these new cases smooth for 100,000. And we look at mortality, let's go back four weeks to be fair. And there we are, you see what I mean? And so interesting, interesting dynamic and there's all your states, it's inconsequential. I mean, we pretend like we can control the weather or whatever it is and or control the pandemic and it looks like it's pretty much doing its own thing and i think that's what the research were really trying to imply and so we did this 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 and i think we are about done tonight for review just to go through the ropes going backwards do 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 we looked at the covid study and thank god get out of the way and so basically a reference to lockdowns and mitigation, including all MPIs as you go through the study, including masks um, and nothing. Let me see if I can find real fast. Here it goes. M-A-S-K, dang it, not come up. There, let's see if I can find that. Oh, thank you, okay, don't need that. Um, yeah, so basically, Look at our definition does not include governmental recommendations, governmental information commands as a mass testing volunteer. 
but do include mandated interventions such as closing schools or businesses, mandated face masks, etc. We define lockdown as any policy consisting of at least one MPI. See, you did not hear that. So non-pharmaceutical intervention. So they could they counted mandated face masks as one of them. And no, that's a really, really sore point with a lot of people because a lot of them felt that the masks instinctively were not as effective as they should be and saw it as being an act of uh, oppression more than an act of disease mitigation. And looks like maybe they were right. Uh, but in the short term, it's about adoption boost long term effects, but contrast other five policies in domestic lockdown, da, 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 da. It was really an interesting aspect. And I think, let's see, is that any further? Uh, but sometimes significant, going down. It goes down the whole line up there, and you can read through it, and just it, it, it goes into all the studies, and it found n overall no justifiable, um, basically, um, reasoning in regard to mask wearing. And so it's, it's our effect focus on the effect of compulsory and our pharmaceutical intervention policy that restrict control of movement, close schools, ban international travel, among others. We do not look at the effect of voluntary behavior changes, da da da. It goes into the whole lineup, and it's a really, really, really a very good read. And like for the Demas study, if we looked at it earlier from Denmark and so on and so forth, they could not ignore it. All that goes into account. All right, get that out of the way. There's that. And let's begin to the next one. Going backwards. And then we looked at this one too. How effective preventive control measures are they justified? Da da da. Real interesting little highlight as a note with higher mortality for lockdown countries was identified. And again, they looked into everything. Not just the mortality from COVID 19, but the lockdowns again cause collateral damage on the other end of the spectrum, which is even greater. Than the virus itself and then when bureaucratic uh motivation started saying oh we have to have zero covid that is just wording alone is basically a defunct aspect in regard to essential and proper risk and uh, risk assessment especially from individuals which claim to be so-called leaders all right then after that we looked at this one here which was do 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 Going up, 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 up. Uh, the winning antibody response, we know about that already. They're just confirming something we already heard a few times with the prior studies. Uh, stealth Omicron. Um, people that could be what these call um, spreaders or wild excretors, uh, so to say. They just sometimes when people can be immunocompromised in such a way or they can't knock the virus and they can spread it for a long period of time. And if they discovered that they thought it was first was because of HIV and stuff like that. And they said, nope, that's not the case. All right, then carditis. Yeah, it's confirmed again. Did you hear this in the media? Hmm? Uh, Cross-country analysis of the COVID-19 mortality rates. Again, another person's trash, another person's gold. Uh, is that significant to you? Or is that even statistically significant? Uh, then nutrients. Big part of it, they found diet. And of course, when we locked people down, the diets became worse. And therefore, that has basically exacerbated their susceptibility to any sort of um, viral pathogen. Then we see that, vitamin D, once again, can't knock it. One more study has come out over and over and over again in reference to vitamin D deficiency prior to generally the hospitalization, not during, but prior, that says, hey, Come on, 14 times more likely to have a severe critical case of COVID-19 than those with higher amounts. How about encouraging a little bit of uh, sunshine and get people out of the house? Oh, sorry, that's counts for lockdown. Well, you get the point. Again, uh, middle of moving, I wanted to take some time to do a quick video for you and uh, especially to clear up the John Hopkins thing and have the links for you so you can uh, find it easier on your own and say that's not the only study recently that came out. The other study that came out in reference to this about the higher mortality for lockdown countries is even worse as far as the outcome due to lockdowns than John Hopkins study. And the John Hopkins study 
said it was to show the point uh, point two, but in the end, uh, the interesting aspect of it was basically they said they had no scientific justification back from 1918, and in the end, the conclusion was uh, do, 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 do. the conclusion was which great place to end it, which I really like it because you can tell that they're trying to figure out where a lot of these leaders got their ideas as well. Um, basically as follows to conclude, the use of lockdowns is a unique feature of the COVID-19 pandemic. Lockdowns have not been used to such a large extent during any of the pandemics of the past century. However, lockdowns during the initial phase of the COVID-19 pandemic have had devastating effects. They have contributed to reducing economic activity, raising unemployment, reducing schooling, causing political unrest, contributing to domestic violence, never mind the fact that people against people have been a horrendous amount of uh, coercion and friction and undermining liberal democracy. These cost societies may be compared to the benefits of lockdowns, which our meta-analysis has shown a marginal at best. Such a standard benefit cost calculation leads to a strong conclusion. Lockdowns should be rejected out of hand as a pandemic policy instrument and with that my friends i must call it a night and thank you very much for listening and i hopefully i can get another video out in reference to this uh maybe within two weeks or so if i don't it's only because i'm in the process of uh moving but again gratitude thank you and i'm always humbled that you listen and i'll catch you all in a little bit see you then bye